and did a PhD in behavioral science, which was a project of the Ford Foundation, uh, which uh, they study economics, math, statistics, sociology, uh, so, uh, psychology in the University of Minnesota. Uh, he was an instructor of physics in the University of Minnesota and uh, also an instructor in economics in the University of Minnesota and moved to the University of Pittsburgh as an assistant professor. In 63, he moved to Berkeley as an assistant professor, became uh, associate professor in 66, and a full professor in 68. He moved to, uh, to MIT in 78 and stayed in MIT up to 1991. And uh, he was uh, James Skillen Chair at MIT and also the director of Statistical Center in that university. After that, he moved back to Berkeley in 1990 and stayed in Berkeley from 1990 up to nowadays. He's also the director of Economic Lab in, at the University of California. Uh, Professor McFadden has several awards and honors. He was elected as a fellow of the Econometric Society in 1969. He got the Clark Medal, which is a leading indicator for the Nobel Prize in 75. He was elected in the American Academy of Science, Art and Science in 77, National Academy of Science in 81, Fish Medals of the Econometric Society in 86, Memorial Prize in Economics in Northwestern, from, which is a grant for outstanding contribution in mathematics and ec or economics, Nobel Prize winner in 2000, and Richard Stone Prize in Applied Econometrics in 2001. He, was, he got an honor degree in UCL, University College London, 2003, member of the American Philosoph Philosophical Society in 2006, an honor degree from North Carolina State University. Uh, in his bio, he said that he wrote uh, written papers on a variety of topics in economics and choice theory, amongst all having origins in applied economics. A common theme in his research has been an emphasis on tightly binding economic theory and problems of economic measurement and analysis, and on developing theoretical and statistical tools to expand the options available to applied economics. I have a, he has a strong appreciation for elegance and innovation in mathematics and statistics, but as a matter of science priority, try to keep his research focused on the concrete applications and provide templates for applied economists to follow. He has many books, some of them are classics, like Urban Travel Demands, a Behavior Analysis in, uh, from 75, who was also reprinted in 1996. He has several articles in many areas, production theory, transportation, econometrics, economic growth and development, economic theory and math econ, energy, health economics, and environmental economics. It's a great pleasure to introduce Professor Mark Fader, who is going to talk of human size or mechanism design. Thank you. Uh, uh, does, it, does this microphone work at this distance? Can you hear me OK? Not too loud, not too soft? No? How, how's that? Better? Oh. OK. I'm going to talk about uh, what I think is probably the most uh, uh, fundamental new idea in economics in the last 50 years in the, in the sense of uh, having the most impact on the profession, and that's mechanism design, and I, I will include game theory as, as uh, part of what I have to say, although, of course, it stands on its own as well. Uh, so mechanism design, as you know, is the systematic analysis of resource allocation institutions and processes, and it reveals the roles of information, communication, uh, command, incentives, and agent processing capacity in uh, resource allocation, and it allows the identification of sources of market failure. Uh, it helps to think about transactions among economic agents in terms of the information they, they uh, communicate and the incentives they have. And these ideas now thread through and connect 
pure and applied research across many fields in economics. And I think the uh, field of economics itself is, is different than it was when I uh, became an economist in 1962. Uh, at that time, economists mostly commented on economic systems, and now they have become architects who design uh, new markets and de design incentive structures and contract terms and, and so forth. Uh, I'm going to uh, talk today about uh, mechanism design, uh, particularly with respect to the role of, of uh, hu uh, agent behavior uh, in, uh, in mechanisms and how, how behavior interacts with the uh, purposes or designs of uh, resource allocation mechanisms. I'm going to start with a very uh, quick overview of, of traditional mechanism design and its relevance to economics. And then I'm going to uh, examine more closely a, a pervasive premise in mechanism design, which is that economic actors respond rationally to the incentives embedded in the mechanism. And what I want to concentrate on is the question of how a behavior uh, may undercut uh, some, some of the in, intents of mechanism design. There's, uh, in, in reality, in real markets, there's a continuing tension between the exuberance and innovativeness of unregulated markets and, the, uh, and government regulation, which is, although sometimes heavy and uh, inconsistent, uh, does seem to be needed uh, and I think mechanism design makes a few standards clear that while many markets uh, can be left to unregulated competition, there are some that are crippled by uh, information, incentive, and behavior problems and require uh, social management for uh, satisfactory operation. I mean, I'll describe a, a number of applied mechanism design problems, but I, and I will concentrate on Two, one is a problem that I worked on myself as a rather narrow interest, uh, which is uh, how to, how to uh, recruit and instruct an economic jury which has to make uh, decisions on public goods. And, and the second, which is a, a, a topic of the day and has been covered better by others than, than I can cover it, which is uh, uh, the regulation of insurance markets with uh, some applications to uh, the issue of credit uh, insurance. So let me begin with a nutshell summary of this subject. Uh, the, uh, this subject uh, really began uh, with the work of Leo Hurwitz and Jacob Marshak in the end of the 1950s, and I think Leo Hurwitz is, deserves, deservedly is known as the father of the subject, but uh, Marshak was a major contributor as well. Uh, Ken Arrow, uh, dealing with uh, economics and information, but was working at the same time. Those are contemporaneous contributions. And then there was parallel, not, not joint, but parallel work by Bill Vickery on uh, incentives and by Herb Simon on the computational limits of agents. And, and those things go together in the sense that computational limits is one of, of course, one of the motivations for a decentralized uh, resource allocation. Now, the uh, role of information and communication developed further in a uh, series of different uh, fields in theory. First, uh, the studies by Akerlof, Spence, and Stiglitz of asymmetric information. Uh, secondly, the studies by uh, Diamond, uh, Hart, LaFont, Maskin, Murleys, Rosen on principal agent problems, and by Radner and Williamson on uh, organizational problems, teams, and uh, governance. Now, the theory of games also contributed fundamentally to these topics, uh, starting from a different starting point and uh, among uh, working economists, Allman, Feudenberg, Harsanyi, Nash, Postlewaite, Ryder, Selton, and Turrell are some of the uh, contributors to this subject, and there are many others, including others here. 
The uh, second branch was uh, started by Bill Vickery in his uh, study of the effect of incentives on, in particular, on auction mechanisms, and that's been furthered uh, through the work of Meyerson, Milgram, uh, Bob Wilson, and uh, public goods mechanisms by Jerry Green, Ted Groves, and John Ledyard. Uh, these topics, uh, auction theory and public goods uh, provision theory, can also be viewed as applications of economic games. Finally, uh, Simon's study of the computational limits of agents and their rationality combined with the application of incentive theory to public goods and auctions fueled the, fueled the development of experimental game theory with uh, Charlie Plott, Al Roth, and Vernon Smith being among important contributors, and also behavioral economics, which is associated uh, with uh, Danny Kahneman and Amos Tversky, and more recently with names like Ernst Freer, David Labson, uh, Matt Rabin, and, and others. Now, there are some additional comments that I can uh, make on this uh, uh, diagram. Uh, first is that while incomplete information incentives and bounded rationality define three major branches of uh, mechanism design and its uh, successors, uh, there's a la an elaborate weaving of interconnections, uh, uh, particularly through game theory, experimental games, and behavioral economics. And second, some of the people that I've put in boxes on this diagram actually uh, have a much broader compass and have, have played an important role in, in developing and integrating the whole subject. And I think here particular names are Peter Diamond, Eric Maskin, Roy Radner, Jean-Jacques Lafont, and Jean Tourault. And uh, third, the importance of this subject has not gone unrecognized. Uh, the names in this slide include 16 winners of the Nobel Prize in Economics, which uh, are they're indicated here in, in uh, green. And I think it's safe to predict that this subject of mechanism design with, with all these theoretical expansions and applications will remain at the center of economics over this century. Uh, many names and new topics will be added, and you'll probably also see some more Nobel Prizes. Uh, I might point out, by the way, that I do not appear on this diagram. I am an outsider to this subject, and you might ask uh, what business an econometrician has commenting on mechanism design. Well, aside from the fact that I, I use some of these ideas in one of the applications I'm going to talk about, I think there is a reason for econometricians to uh, be interested in this subject, which is that uh, when a, an economic agent uh, has imperfect or incomplete information, uh, that agent has, has an inference problem, has an econometric problem. And economic agents to, uh, need to understand that they have to behave like econometricians, and when we model the behavior of economic agents, uh, we need to understand that uh, as well. So I think it does help uh, in looking at mechanism design to uh, think sometimes like an econometrician. Now, a premise that pervades the theory of mechanism design is that economic agents act in their self-interest. Uh, the binding constraint on efficient resource allocation, uh, if this is uh, correct, is the amount and, and uh, reliability of the information that agents receive. And if so, if they can get uh, good information and the information they need, uh, then their own rationality will take care of the, the rest. Uh, and, and secondly, uh, going back to one of the original motivations of Leo Hurwitz in, in uh, developing this whole uh, subject, uh, the problem was that central planning, uh, uh, central planners don't have the bandwidth or computational capacity to do resource allocation well, but uh, individual agents who have a, a more limited need for information do have enough capacity to uh, deal with what they have to deal with. Well, that is, that's really a statement about the capacity of agents. Individual agents have enough capacity to do what they need to do, but a central, central agent uh, uh, does not. I don't, uh, is it true? Probably so. But here's the, uh, here's the issue, which is that in reality, human agents may fail to recognize or act on their self-interest. 
and that makes their rationality an issue in evaluating the efficiency of resource allocation mechanisms. Now, this, was, this is not new. In fact, this is really what Herb Simon was saying from the very, very beginning, that there are bounds on, uh, on the, the ability of agents to be <coughs> rational. But I think we have many more tools and a lot more research now on uh, what the nature of the limits on rationality are. Right, and we can look more carefully at this problem. Uh, among the uh, human limitations, uh, there are many, but I'm going to concentrate on a, a few. One is that we have bounded attention, or if you like, uh, budgets for attention. And uh, there's a very nice quote from Herb Simon uh, in this respect, a wealth of information creates a poverty of attention. Uh, what we uh, see, uh, we see the, uh, the effect of attention limits in, in the market. We see heavy advertising and, and teaser introductory prices for uh, uh, new customers for products. And then we see low switching rates uh, for, for uh, durables like mobile phones and insurance. Once a, a firm acquires a customer, they can often keep them without necessarily meeting the spot market. Uh, people make systematic uh, mistakes in memory, and that uh, affects our our perception. So one uh, one in particular is we we you all have had uh, experienced remarkable coincidences. You re you remember those. Uh, what you don't remember are the, all the remarkable non coincidences uh, that you faced. And as a result of this selective memory, you uh, you tend to uh, infer correlations and patterns. Uh, uh, to random variables that are, in fact, um, uh, independent of each other. So that leads to systematic distortions in, uh, in perceptions. There are also limits to uh, reasoning. And in particular, uh, we, we use shortcuts in reasoning. We use exemplars and, and analogies to guide decisions rather than uh, reasoning through the consequences uh, in full. Uh, we also have a bad habit of discounting ambiguous information. We focus on the dimensions of uh, alternatives where comparisons are easy, and we can avoid the uh, heavy tasks of data collection or computation. Uh, that means that we pay too much attention to the present and not enough to the future, which is more ambiguous. Uh, we pay too much attention to easily measured features of products like prices and uh, too little to features like durability, which is more ambiguous, and so forth. And finally, uh, we are guided by sociality, which is the proclivity of humans to imitate others and be guided by norms of reciprocity and altruism. Now, you might bridle at the notion that that's a shortcoming. In fact, it's, it's in some sense, it's what makes us human. But uh, uh, it, it is, uh, it, you, it is interesting to consider how it influences uh, rationality. Uh, sociality is not necessarily antagonistic to rationality, but it does blur the lines from individual decisions to consequences, and it, it opens the door to uh, complacency and some forms of moral hazard. Uh, and uh, here I'll use uh, one of my favorite examples, which is uh, the behavior of riders in a bicycle race. They affiliate uh, voluntarily with the peloton, which is the mass of right, the wedge-shaped mass of riders, which uh, generally move together through a bicycle race. Well, the peloton provides an energy-saving, choice-limited environment. If you're in the middle of the peloton, you just keep uh, pumping. You, you don't uh, get to turn left or right, and you don't go faster or slower. You just uh, follow the follow the others. Uh, occasionally, yeah, people will break away, but that's where the choice comes. Uh, in, uh, the Peloton promotes, actually promotes efficient resource allocation by uh, uh, reducing requirements for attention and information collection and processing. But it also, uh, so it's not necessarily irrational to, to use that kind of uh, uh, joining the group behavior. But uh, it, it works well in the right environment. But in the wrong environment, uh, it can allow uh, various uh, 
things that you regret to happen, such as uh, getting on board a bubble and uh, not getting off in time or uh, falling for a Ponzi scheme uh, because other people are doing it. Uh, and I think that uh, uh, you, you've actually heard a lot about the global credit crisis here. Uh, at least some of that crisis, I think, is due to uh, Peloton behavior of, of, uh, of investment banks, uh, following, following others uh, without paying uh, close attention to the, to the consequences. I think a major uh, challenge to understanding the behavior of economic agents is to explain the economic and social mechanisms that cause pelotons to form and occasionally uh, cause them to break apart. Now, um, mechanism design theory in, uh, as pure theory is one of the more abstruse subjects in economics, and it may not strike uh, many applied economists as a useful day-to-day -day guide to practical problems of economic policy. But I think, in fact, the, the uh, organizing concepts of mechanism design theory are of fundamental practical importance, and policy economics is well served by recognizing its connections to this unifying theory. So I'm going to turn now to a, a, a short list of practical problems, uh, just selected from many, uh, in which uh, uh, issues of mechanism theory matter. Uh, the uh, first uh, is the, uh, there are some papers by Roche and Tirol, uh, with the, uh, which is essentially the Ramsey pricing question. If you have a platform industry that's between uh, buyers and sellers, how do you finance the cost of that industry? Do you charge the buyers? Do you charge the sellers? If there's multiple products, uh, which products get taxed uh, more heavily? A, a second example from yesterday, uh, Preston McAfee talked about how to, how to set Pigovian taxes to handle externalities in the situation where the signal of, uh, on the action was noisy. Well, I think those are both uh, good examples of uh, practical problems in, in mechanism design, which, which uh, uh, go very quickly back to the, back to the fundamentals. Uh, the two that I will concentrate on uh, is how to select and instruct an economic jury, which is uh, given the job of valuing uh, public projects. And then finally, I, I will uh, pile on to the, uh, the popular topic of the day uh, with a few final comments on uh, in, in insurance markets and the problem of regulating uh, insurance markets, particularly uh, for credit insurance. So uh, let me begin with the, the uh, question of how you value a, a public project. Uh, just, just for concreteness, uh, uh, give you an example. Suppose that you were, wanted to determine uh, what, what the willingness of humans around the globe would be to try to roll back carbon dioxide emissions to pre-industrial organization levels. What proportion of, of uh, your lifetime income would you be willing to devote to uh, do that uh, uh, do that action, which presumably would uh, protect us against uh, climate changes we may, we might not like? Uh, so the question is, how how would you uh, determine this? Well, one possibility is that you would uh, form an economic jury, and and by an economic jury, I just I mean a a uh, a group of judges the way you would have a jury that judges architecture or judges a sports competition. Uh, in, the, in the example, the economic jurors would be consumers and their, their expertise would be their knowledge of their own preferences. Uh, now, an economic jury might be uh, elected, appointed, or sampled randomly, but one of the ways in particular you might choose it is by essentially forming a uh, random sample of consumers. So that would be an economic jury. And if you look at the relationship between the, the social planner who's trying to uh, get this information and the, the jurors who have the information, what you have is a principal agent problem. The, uh, the respondents in the survey are the agents. And what we know about such problems from 
uh, Diamond, Merleys, Lafont, Maskin, Rosen, and others, is that the, uh, the major design task is to align the incentives of the principal and of the agents so the agents have a positive incentive to be truthful and that a significant constraint on this exercise is to provide the compensation necessary to assure the agent's uh, participation. Now I'm going to, uh, I, I'll say a little more perhaps than, than uh, I, I need to about uh, how you might do it at this kind of survey. Uh, most of you know about contingent valuation, uh, which is what I'm going to refer to. Uh, you, you might imagine that a simple approach to finding out consumers' willingness to pay for a public good is to just ask them to state their preferences. That's an old idea. In fact, it was first proposed by the psychologist Leon Thurstone at the urging of his Chicago economist colleague Henry Schultz. And Thurstone gave a paper on this subject at the second meeting of the Econometric Society in 1932. Uh, uh, Ragnar Frisch and Harold Hotelling were in the audience, a pretty impressive audience for those days, and they are reported to have stood up and, and uh, objected to the Thurstone's idea on the spot and declared it unworkable. Uh, Milton Friedman later wrote a paper uh, also that criticized the approach as uh, unworkable. And it never made the list of acceptable economic tools. So if you look at the, the, the monumental books of the 40s and 50s, uh, Hicks and Samuelson on consumer theory, uh, there's no notion that uh, you could ask consumers directly about their preferences. The only preference information allowed in that view of economics were actual market choices revealed preference theory. But Thurstone's ideas reappeared in the 1960s in psychometrics and in market research. It was then called conjoint analysis and the technique asks subjects to make repeated choices between alternatives in, in an experimental design. Contingent valuation, which is the, uh, you might call conjoint analysis light, uh, is a, a version uh, developed in resource economics in the 1970s with a, with a limited experimental design. Uh, today, contingent valuation is uh, widely used in applied economics, I think still viewed with skepticism by many economists. On the other hand, conjoint analysis bec has become the dominant methodology in market research and is credited with the successful design and launch of, of many, t many new products. So it may not be uh, quite the same as revealed preference data, but at least in terms of practical applications, there is definitely information in contingent evaluation. So one of the questions is, uh, what in, if you're actually doing a contingent uh, evaluation or that kind of a direct elicitation of preferences, uh, what kind of, uh, what is the, the mechanism design problem is how to uh, recruit the respondents and how to elicit uh, truthful uh, responses. And I'm, I'm going to uh, uh, be uh, very brief here. That There's a paper behind this talk which actually has a lot of, lot of technical detail in it, but I'm going to avoid any equations and just uh, talk generally about the problem. I, I think it's helpful. Here's a place where, where it's helpful to use the tools of mechanism design, but also useful to think like an econometrician. What you're trying to do, let's first of all think about the problem of, of recruiting a jury. What you're trying to do is recruit agents. Well, that's, that's the principal agent problem where you're trying to meet the constraint for, for participation. How you do that? Well, you pay, you, you pay a participation fee. But thinking as, the, as an econometrician, a, a, particip a participation fee is a treatment. And by varying the treatment, you have the possibility of doing an experiment in which you learn about non-participants by uh, varying the treatment, uh, which has differential effects on the recruitment of uh, participants. Uh, you also have, within, within the process of recruiting and instructing juries, other ways to uh, build in experimental treatments, which allow you to do statistical pros 
post-processing of the reports of agents. And I, I think, that, that actually, I think this is a, there's some uh, good research to be done in, the, in this area. Uh, the, the opportunity to, to do, uh, go further with statistics, with econometrics, than you can do by, a, say, a, 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 a simple direct uh, design of a principal agent contract without um, uh, this, th uh, this kind of additional ability to process the, uh, the responses. Well, there's a very, uh, there's a very nice, uh, let's see where I, uh, there's, there's a, a nice paper by Tom Phillipson, a couple of papers which uh, treat the problem of, of recruiting uh, survey participants as a, uh, a, sample, uh, a sample selection problem. And in my own work, I, I uh, do that as a non-parametric uh, bivariate uh, selection problem. I use the, uh, the interval identification uh, techniques of Mansky and some of the quantile uh, uh, estimation methods of uh, Rosa Matskin, and it all makes a rather, rather nice package for, uh, uh, and I also use uh, a, a very simple uh, general equilibrium model, which uh, has an analytics, uh, well, a, a closed form solution for the private good prices using uh, Rolf Mantel's ideas, and all those things together make a, I think, uh, really a, quite a nice package, which can can really be used by um, uh, by applied economists to uh, advance uh, public good uh, de uh, decisions. Um, one uh, comment on on the the findings from that is that uh, what you find is that okay, not quite yet. Uh, what oops. Uh, what you find is that uh, uh, if, if we, we, in applications is that it pays it pays to uh, compensate jurors very well. Uh, and, and to use experimental treatments on, on the participation fees. Uh, if you do that, then you, you often do not need very large samples to make public good decisions. And the reason for that is simple. Namely, if the decision is easy, if it's clear cut, it doesn't take a lot of observations to find that out. And if the decision is close, uh, then there's very little welfare loss from making a mistake. And so there's not no point in spending a whole lot of money uh, making a huge survey to find that out. Now, the, the second aspect of dealing with an economic jury is uh, to get the el elicitation, which will elicit truthful responses. And I'm going to uh, speak just very briefly about uh, two techniques. These are uh, fairly standard. And what I want to do is, is not spend time on them, but, but get to some of the experimental results and, and summarize the experimental results. There are basically uh, two mechanisms. One is the Gross-Clark mechanism, which works well when you have linear transferable uh, uh, utility. And there's a version of that by uh, 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 Green and Lafont, which uh, applies to, to juries, uh, applies directly to uh, juries. So that's one mechanism. And, uh, and that's a, uh, a provision point mechanism, which Get, has to get the incentives to the individual aligned with the social planner's uh, incentives so that the individual uh, base, basically becomes an avatar for the social planner and, and uh, uh, responds in the way the social planner would like. Uh, that is to say to, to give uh, true preferences. Uh, the second mechanism was originally uh, a, a version of the second price auction mechanism due to Becker, De Groot, and Marshak, and that's been adopted by Palfrey and uh, Rosenthal for, uh, 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 for use in juries. And that's a, uh, uh, that, that's a voting mechanism. The, the uh, uh, respondents give a threshold uh, 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 with the property that if the cost of the project is below the threshold, they would vote for it and, and not otherwise. And, under uh, fairly simple conditions, that is, uh, uh, that's truth revealing. Uh, 
and I, I think I've described what those are. Uh, in fact, let me go back one second. Uh, the, uh, the Groves uh, Clark mechanism in uh, tested experimentally, uh, what, you, what you find is that uh, uh, jurors have a hard time dealing with that mechanism. That's a mechanism in which you basically have to iterate to, uh, to equilibrium, and it's, it's actually quite hard to, to get uh, jurors to understand uh, and track that so that they, uh, they conform to, the, uh, to, to what should be the rational response. And furthermore, as the size of the jury rises, compliance uh, falls, and that's because the, uh, the marginal rewards uh, to a, a single juror be, uh, become fairly small as the, as the jury size rises. Uh, the Beck, uh, Becker, DeGroot, uh, Marshak, uh, Palfrey, Rosenthal mechanism uh, seems to have better performance. It's easier for jurors to understand, and uh, in, in, at least in moderately sized juries, uh, you get quite good compliance with that mechanism. It's, it's a more of an individualistic uh, mechanism, and, and it's easier for uh, people. And it's not uh, uh, an equilibrium mechanism, so you don't have to iterate. So if you compare these mechanisms, uh, I, uh, let me just summarize uh, what I think are some of the, uh, the, the key uh, conclusions that one can reach. Uh, one thing that seems to be clear is that when a game is, is zero sum or purely competitive, then the social norm is, is in a competitive game, it's, it's perfectly all right to be competitive and try to win, and people do that. However, if the, if the game has payoffs to cooperation, uh, so, that, so it's a non-zero sum game. Then there's a social norm that it's selfish not to try to find a, a cooperative uh, solution. Uh, and so, uh, depending on, on the, the way the, the, the elicitation mechanism uh, in, for a public good is set up, if it's set up in a way which it, it can stress the individual benefits, uh, then, then you'll get better compliance to uh, to rationality. Otherwise, you may get uh, altruistic behavior, which uh, is is uh, great in reality, but a but a problem in um, when you are trying to measure uh, preferences. Uh, second, compliance is greater when the mechanism is transparent uh, as well as individualistic. And third, compliance is greater when the penalties for deviation from compliance are strong uh, and and obvious. Uh, in general, the evidence on response to incentives uh, supports the proposition that when stakes are high, self-interest uh, prevails. Uh, behavior is closest to rational when alternatives are unambiguous and the choice task is, is uh, uh, familiar. Now, my conclusions uh, on jury selection uh, uh, this, on this particular problem are that an, uh, an, an adequately representative uh, truthful responses on the value of public projects can be obtained from small, well-compensated uh, juries. Uh, sociality uh, does uh, confound social valuation. Small payoffs invite uh, inattention, so in, in the design of these mechanisms, one needs to uh, be careful in how, how you handle sociality and uh, that you keep the payoffs big enough so that they uh, keep people's uh, attention. Uh, now we turn to the uh, last uh, uh, application, uh, which is uh, the organization and management of markets uh, for insurance. I think uh, economists have long understood that the conditions for efficient free markets are difficult to meet in the case of insurance. Uh, information about risk is often asymmetric, and ensuring risk invites economic agents to be less careful about avoiding and minimizing losses, uh, the problem of, of moral hazard. So um, uh, moral hazard uh, arises, one, because the incentives to be careful are reduced, but uh, turning the coin the other way around, uh, the benefits of being careful can, cannot necessarily be uh, acquired back to the individual so that it's very hard to get a separating equilibrium where you're 
uh, uh, grouped only with other people who are careful. Uh, another problem with insurance coverage is that it, is, it tends to be intertemporal. It's contingent on future events. And so a, a market for insurance coverage must operate in a, a contractual and legal environment that ensures that policy terms uh, will be honored, that, that when a loss occurs, the insurance company is still there and sufficiently capitalized to uh, cover uh, the losses. Uh, because of these uh, information and contractual issues, insurance markets uh, seem to be more vulnerable than many other markets to uh, various kinds of uh, Ponzi schemes. And I think that's one of the reasons there's a long tradition of, of uh, regulating uh, insurance markets. Now, one of the uh, things that uh, one aspect of the current uh, crisis, uh, among other things, has been the collapse of the market for uh, credit uh, insurance. Now, uh, that's a, a particular piece of the, uh, of the credit market. Uh, and uh, I, there are others here who know a great deal more about uh, credit markets than I do, and, and I, I uh, yield to John Giannakopoulos and others on for a, a probably mo more uh, accurate and coherent description of what's going on with the credit crisis. But uh, one aspect of it, which I think is, is uh, one of the factors, is a, basically an, an insurance uh, failure. Uh, let me just say a word. I think this, this probably is known, uh, well, first of all, uh, what, what's the role of economists in, the, in this market? And this is a cartoon that appeared last spring, actually, well before things got as bad as they are now. Uh, and the, uh, the second panel there has, I think, the key statement, uh, with the advice from the economist theories born, um, uh, I think w w some role uh, of us is uh, some blame uh, may fall on us for uh, the, the failure of this market, although I think it's uh, uh, only a small fraction of economists uh, were enthused about the way this market uh, developed. Uh, and let me say a word about the history, even though I think this is, is well known. Uh, historically, the U.S. had a a, a, a successful program of reinsurance for conforming home mortgages, and two government chartered companies, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, uh, handled that. And they packaged uh, their, uh, the, the, their insurance obligations uh, into securities which were then uh, uh, sold. So effectively, that was a, a form of rein, reinsurance. And uh, because conforming mortgages were uh, uh, the terms for those were fairly rigorous, uh, there was not a lot of systematic risk in the traditional uh, FHA uh, uh, market that those uh, firms handled. Now, uh, in, at the beginning of this decade, a little before, uh, private banks began emulating the uh, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac model by uh, also securitizing uh, uh, private mortgages, and these uh, were uh, included, what are now uh, sub subprime mortgages, and uh, this was done with the uh, with a tacit assent of, of the uh, Federal Reserve Bank under uh, Alan Greenspan. Well, this had a uh, it said it had a, a great expansionary expansionary effect on on credit, and fueled uh, a lot a lot of new home purchases in the U.S. Now, one of the, uh, uh, the, the uh, in, uh, insurance aspect of this comes through these uh, credit default swaps, which are uh, basically a, uh, a, a, just an insurance policy. Uh, the, these are, these uh, CDSs were not uh, uh, guaranteed, guaranteed by the government, so their value depended on the prudent self-interest of, uh, of their issuers. Uh, despite, uh, despite the fact that they carried uh, systemic risk, uh, the market uh, picked those up, seems to have undervalued the, the uh, uh, systemic risk. And uh, one of the, uh, 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 pr probably a critical feature of uh, uh, credit default swaps was that uh, 
uh, uh, those things uh, uh, could themselves be packaged and resold or rein reinsured so that uh, there, there was a, a kind of a, I would actually call it a, a, a Ponzi game in which uh, you could, uh, you could uh, sell, sell CDSs but then reinsure them by buying one from someone else so you'd, you'd pass most of the risk along. In fact, you could, you could uh, uh, in buying, you could, you could over cover your, uh, uh, your risk so that there was a kind of an expansionary aspect to it. Uh, a, a, a particular event which I think contributed a lot uh, to this uh, was the, the relaxation in 2003 of uh, the constraints on uh, the large investment banks in which they were basically allowed to act as, uh, as uh, non-banking brokers uh, in, in markets like this. And so when, when the CDS uh, became a, uh, began to become an important uh, uh, financial instrument, the investment banks as well as uh, large insurance companies like AIG uh, became uh, large uh, uh, issuers in this, uh, in this market. Uh, and the result of this uh, over just a few years was that by this past summer, uh, there was basically what I would call risk laundering um, and, and it's a pyramid of, of roughly $52 trillion in CDSs constructed on a base of about $1 trillion in subprime mortgages. Now, there were, several, uh, uh, there were a number of problems with the development of this market. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, uh, the, well, the market in general and, and uh, uh, the default insurance in particular, uh, uh, first, uh, these instruments don't eliminate the risk. They, they just, uh, they may diversify it, uh, but they, they, somebody ends up uh, holding, holding that risk. But as you, as you got a pyra pyramid of uh, CDSs, uh, it became unclear that who was actually holding the risk in the end or what the, what the risks were that uh, a, an issuer was actually obligated uh, to uh, cover. And I think this actually uh, acquired some of the characteristics of a, of a Ponzi game. It seemed like anybody, any large bank or insurance company could get into this market, uh, issue some CDs, and then lay off all the risk by selling it to, some, to someone else, and it was then somebody else's problem. Uh, the, uh, the, the second uh, major, uh, and, and uh, uh, reser re I think normal reserve requirements were not being uh, uh, re uh, uh, required here or monitored carefully so that in the end, uh, the, the, the cap capital necessary to cover these things was not necessarily uh, there. Uh, second, the presence of default insurance created a, I think, a serious problem of moral hazard. Uh, lenders, uh, faced with the, the opportunity of, of laying off these risks, uh, were uh, willing to take chances, in particular, uh, to uh, push towards more risky loans, which they didn't have to pay the penalty for in terms of a higher uh, premium for their uh, default insurance. And the third uh, problem uh, is, uh, was, I think, uh, uh, well, uh, you can have uh, phenomena market instruments in a market where a little of it is a good thing, but a lot of it becomes a bad thing. If you look back at the market crash in 1987, uh, it it was caused by what was called index insurance. Index insurance began a few years earlier than that. It was really quite a good idea, which was that. Uh, uh, essentially, you could, you could uh, at a premium, take a, take a position in which uh, you would be able to liquidate uh, your holdings if the index drops. So you, could, you can guarantee it yourself against a, any substantial loss. Uh, it was, a, it was a, quite a clever derivative. It became very, very popular. So what happened in 1987? The market started going down. People went to exercise their um, uh, uh, index insurance and suddenly the other side of the market was not there. And that's, that was the source of the 1987 crash. I think what we're seeing now, at least a lot of it, 
is a similar sort of similar sort of thing. Uh, people uh, started with the CDSs, which were in principle a good a good derivative. They uh, lubricated these markets. Uh, it turns out that not enough friction was left, perhaps, but in the end, they became uh, so uh, so important, so so large, that uh, when it came time to you had a loss on some subprime mortgages, and you turn to to uh, uh, t uh, get reimbursed for the loss, suddenly the uh, uh, the issuer wasn't there, the, m the market wasn't there. Uh, I can't resist uh, 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 asking who's, uh, uh, in the end, in, in who's, who's really responsible for this, and I would say there's, there's a, a gang of four ardent capitalists who are probably uh, uh, responsible for this uh, 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 in the current administration, uh, in addition to the president, Alan Greenspan, Henry Paulson, who was instrumental in getting the investment banks into trouble and is now charged with getting them back out of it again, and uh, Christopher Cox, who is head of the SEC and who, who failed to exercise prudent management of, uh, of this uh, business. I, uh, uh, as long as I'm uh, uh, stepping outside uh, uh, sort of uh, scientific, narrow scientific economics. Let me let me uh, cite a, a one of the conservative pundits in the U.S. who was actually one of the intellectual leaders of the conservative uh, Hayekian uh, movement in the U.S. Very pro free market. Uh, he now had some pretty serious reconsiderations, and I, uh, this I think is a, a quote uh, worth noting. He says. I suspect that free marketers need to be less doctrinaire and less simple-mindedly utility maximizing. I think they should take much more seriously the task of thinking through what are the right rules of the road for both the private and public sectors. They'll have to figure out what institutional barriers and what monetary, fiscal, and legal guardrails are needed for the accountability, transparency, and responsibility that allow free markets to work. And he goes on to say, I don't see why conservatives ought to defend a system that permits securitizing mortgages in a way that seems to make the lenders almost unaccountable for the risk. I don't see why a commitment to free markets requires permitting banks to leverage their assets at 30 to 1. There's no, nothing conservative about letting free markets degenerate into something close to Karl Marx's vision of an atomizing, irresponsible, and self-devouring capitalism. Uh, so I think for once he's right. Uh, uh, the, the conclusions to be drawn from the uh, credit insurance fiasco, I think, are that resource allocation mechanisms matter, that it's uh, ignorant and destructive to let mechanism design principles, fundamental principles, uh, uh, be ignored uh, uh, on, uh, for the sake of, of uh, ideology. There is, there is a place perhaps a leading place for free markets, but not all markets should be un, uh, unregulated. Uh, finally, what, what, can, what can be done? Uh, I think others will have more to say about this and probably more intelligence to say about it, but let me make a few comments just in terms of uh, the fundamentals of mechanism design. Uh, first of all, in, in terms of control, there needs to be coordinated regulation around the globe to prevent regulatory arbitrage. Uh, second, in terms of behavior, there needs to be uh, uh, some third-party standards for control of behavior. The, one of the problems with the current crisis is that uh, banks were asked to self-regulate their behavior. That didn't, that didn't work. There needs to be third-party stress testing of, of new uh, financial derivatives. There needs to be uh, uh, regulatory review uh, in which people are asked, do you really want to stay in this peloton as it uh, goes over uh, the cliff? More generally, uh, I would say, in, in terms of this whole subject, resource allocation mechanisms uh, matter. Market design should be uh, matched to the information situation that prevails in, in a particular uh, situation. 
uh, markets for risk in particular are vulnerable to breakdown unless they're uh, uh, carefully uh, regulated. Uh, my own work is, is actually on, insu on health insurance markets, not, uh, not credit insurance markets, but the same uh, the problem there is exactly the same. And uh, in general, no matter what your political uh, predilections, uh, there is a need to think carefully about uh, how various market allocation uh, mechanisms work. Uh, I, it may well be that uh, as, uh, as of uh, today, uh, a, a pure Hayekian view of, of uh, resource allocation is, is dead, uh, but uh, it, shouldn't, it shouldn't all die, but it certainly shouldn't all live. Thank you. We have time for one or two questions. Thank you.